Welcome back to TYT. Anna Kasparian and Jenk with you. Uh, Jenk was doing some research uh, during our break, and he actually found an update on the Eva Longoria, Tony Parker breakup, divorce. What's going on, Jenk? Tell us. Uh, well, it turns out that she is uh, divorcing him because he had exchanged hundreds of text messages in one month alone with a mutual female friend. Dirty, what? dirty. Oh, that's the update. That's actually what, that's the first thing I read about this story. And then that's why I just assume that's why they broke up or that's why they're divorcing. I know, but a mutual female friend, isn't that dirtier, Anna? Yeah, it's dirtier, but unsurprising. Men usually do things like that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But yeah, it's dirtier. And, and it made me wonder who it is. Like, is it someone who was Eva Longoria's best friend, and then all of a sudden she was hanging out with Mr. Parker, and she's like, mm, 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 texty, texty. <laughs> texty, texty. <laughs> Could you imagine? Could you imagine if it's Terry Hatcher? Ooh, drums. <laughs> <laughs> drums? That's the new thing? Oh, boy. I can't pull that off. That's a little too uh, metrosexual. Let's put it that way. No, that'd be a great episode of Desperate Housewives. But, Matt, see... <laughs> Jake, it's so discouraging. Like, first we have Steve talking about how, yeah, if my fiancé got paralyzed, I'd leave her ass. And then we have Eva Longoria and Tony Parker breaking up. And then we have Mel Gibson and Grigori Ava, you know, beating each other down. Like, why would anyone want to get married? <laughs> that, that's, okay, my, that's my outcome. You know why? Because in the news, they don't report happy marriages. <laughs> they don't say, like, hey, today Jake and Wendy had another lovely day. <laughs> <laughs> You have you only get the bad news. You see right. what I'm saying? And by the way, Longoria, psh, come on, easiest strike back in the world. You think his uh, teammates won't have sex with you? You're crazy. <laughs> Tim Duncan can't wait to tap that ass. You know, um, Ladise and I always get into a, uh, an argument about Leva, Eva Longoria and Tony Parker because his argument is she's too old for him, so they shouldn't have gotten married in the first place. But I think she looks insanely good. I think she's, like, super hot, and I think that he was lucky to land her. Yeah, for a 35-year-old. Oh, you're done. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I'm kidding. She looks fantastic. And, but, yes, there's a seven, eight-year difference. doesn't matter. They're a celebrity couple. It was never going to last. Everybody knows it, right? So they never had a chance. But, uh, you know, look, uh, I'm kidding about Tim Duncan, obviously. But it would be... Shocking if she couldn't find someone on the Spurs to, you know, do a little strike back with. I mean, shit, if he was on the Cavaliers, somebody would have fucked his mom, let alone his wife. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> That's a reference to LeBron James. I'm a bad man. You know, we haven't gotten any updates on the LeBron James story. I'm, I'm very curious to see what happened with that. Uh, what, with his mom? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I mean, yeah, this. I'd be surprised if we ever got an update. If somebody ever came out and said, "Oh yeah, yeah, uh, I'm dirty, dirty. I was the one with LeBron's mom." All right. <laughs> so wrong. All right, and then you have another story for us uh, that you just found out about a man shot at his TV while watching Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, here's the situation. We got a guy named Stephen uh, Cowan. He's 67 years old. He's in a town uh, called Vermont, Wisconsin. It's actually 15 miles uh, west of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And he gets home, and he's had a hard day. He's actually having some financial troubles. He's in a bad mood, and he had a couple of drinks, according to his wife. Uh, he goes to sit down and relax and watch Dancing with the Stars with his wife. And uh, Bristol Palin comes up. He gets so upset that they are intermingling politics with his beloved Dancing with the Stars. And he gets... He gets doubly upset because he thinks it's so obvious what a bad dancer she is. So he says something to the effect of the effing politics, takes out his gun, and shoots the TV. Okay? Oh, my God. Now, man, 
that must be some terrible dancing by Bristol Palin. And then, but like, look, the guy's, of course, got some issues. Uh, he might have bipolar disorder. He then points a gun at his wife and says, go get me more guns. And she thinks better of it and goes against the cops. And then the SWAT team has a stand down with him for a long time. And then finally he puts down the gun and everything's okay. But the fact that Bristol Palin's dancing is what pushed him over the edge amused me to no end. Yeah, I mean, I personally have gotten emotional several times watching Dancing with the Stars. You really get invested in the show. You know, you really begin to root for some of the people. You really start to uh, feel disappointed when the person you are invested in gets voted off. So I totally understand. I mean, if I had a gun, I would shoot at my TV. <laughs> I hope that's not the case. But listen, uh, you know, there's like people are really worked up about this season because Brandy apparently was the best dancer, according to a lot of people. But uh, Bristol beat her out, uh, and then she made it into the finals. And so, as you were just saying earlier, that's drums. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, now there's this conspiracy theory that the Palin's political people, or like, I guess her supporters, political supporters, are like phoning in so much that Bristol's winning. I, I, I doubt, I really doubt that's true. I have my own conspiracy theory that I don't really quite believe, but it's fun. I think that the producers are saying, yeah, we get in the news every single week with something with Bristol Palin. She's doing an ad with the situation about abstinence. She's doing this. She's doing that. Is how modest is her dress. They got to keep her around for the ratings as long as possible. And that conspiracy theory is really not a bad one. No, I think your conspiracy theory is totally accurate. Bristol Palin, I mean, from what I've seen, is a disastrous dancer. She's horrible, okay? She's so bad. In fact, she's the only contestant in Dancing with the Stars history that has actually gained weight while on the show. How is that yeah. possible? How is that well, possible? Wait, no, wait a minute now. Look, I thought I was going to be the super bad guy if I brought up. I was going to bring it up. But, like, we're having some chunk situation, right? No, okay, here's what happened, okay? Here's what was happening in the TYT newsroom, <laughs> all right? Uh, Tom sent me and JR an article about how uh, Bristol Palin allegedly gained some weight while on Dancing with the Stars. I didn't believe it, but then I looked up more articles, and yeah, she's gained 15 pounds. I mean, not only do these news reports say it, you can tell in the way she looks. She looks pretty big. And I'm not trying to, you know, say disparaging things about her and make her feel, t feel terrible because she's got a little chunky wonky going on. But it's the truth. I mean, you're supposed to train eight hours a day when you're on Dancing with the Stars. And you must eat a lot of food if you're training eight hours a day and you're still gaining weight. Okay, now let's go to an even worse conspiracy theory. Okay? Because, look, man, training that for eight hours a day, people lose a lot of weight on that show. Aaron Andrews lost a ton of weight, etc. I mean... I don't think you can eat that many subs to still gain 15 pounds. 15 pounds in that short period of time while working eight hours a day. Yeah. Is it possible that she's pregnant again? With her dance partner? <laughs> or the situation. Oh, that would be the best! Oh, my God. Can you imagine? <laughs> now, that's the definition of drums. <laughs> okay. By the way, I, I want everybody, please, let's be super, okay, keep it real here. We're just playing bus nuts, okay? She ain't pregnant. We're just, so Bush was at speculation. It's not even real speculation. So Mama Grizzly, put down your paws, because you know Sarah Palin watching this is like, ah, my kids. <laughs> well, you know, it's so typical of us libs to attack the children like that. That's yeah. all we do. Yeah, poor <laughs> children who are on a reality show. They, they're like in 18 different reality shows. I forgot that she's got her own reality show. And by the way, what, what's wrong with the first dude? Oh, no, no, no. I got to tell you. I got to tell you. So uh, speaking of the other Palin reality show, it's called um, Sarah Palin's Alaska. It's on TLC. And I actually have a story related to this. So apparently Willow Palin, uh, the 16-year-old uh, daughter of Sarah Palin, um, got into a feud on Facebook with one of her Facebook friends who wrote a status update that said uh, uh, Sarah Palin's Alaska is failing so hard right now. <laughs> so apparently he was watching and he thought it was lame and he wrote a, a status update about it. Wait, who wrote, the who wrote the status update? One of Willow Palin's friends on Facebook. Oh. Yeah. 
His name is Trevor. I don't know what his last name is because they uh, blocked it out to protect his identity. But apparently he was not a fan of uh, Sarah Palin's reality show. So he wrote about it on Facebook. Willow Palin saw that and she was really upset about it. So, you know, she basically said that the guy is so gay because that is a great insult, you know, calling someone gay. She then goes on to call him the F word, faggot, okay? And, you know, Willow Palin is getting a lot of heat for this, understandably. But my favorite part, I actually read through the entire conversation because it's hilarious. My favorite part is uh, Willow then gets into a little feud with some guy named Matt. And Matt, she actually calls Matt fat, okay? And then Willow Palin writes back to him and said, not, uh, I'm sorry, Matt writes back to Willow and says, not as fat as Bristol. The only pro program I enjoyed from your family was Nalen Palin. Yo, oh, damn. Once again, deep drums. <laughs> drums, yes. Okay, hold up, hold up. Mm -hmm. I, I got to really, on this one, I, I can't believe I'm going to say the sentence, but my heart goes out to Sarah Palin on this one. Because, look, we are too much in her business. I mean, we're talking about the text or the post or whatever that her 16-year-old daughter is doing with her friend, the friend who gives a shit what he's saying, and she uses the wrong words, and it's terrible, and she shouldn't, et cetera, et cetera. But come on, I mean, you think people in the audience, you don't have 16-year-old daughters and sons who've said that word in joking around between friends? Maybe they shouldn't, but that, that becomes a national story. Oh, man. No, look, and don't get me wrong. I know, I know. She invites us. She's got a reality show in her house, right? right. They're on two reality shows. Having said that, yeah, I don't know that anybody's family could withstand that kind of scrutiny. No, I agree. The scrutiny sucks, except uh, Sarah Palin, as you mentioned, is looking for it. She enjoys it, so that's what she gets. And I particularly enjoy the drums, so... Okay. <laughs> I'm so I'm, I can't believe we have a new word, and it's so disastrous. <laughs> All right, all right. Uh, we're going to be back with uh, political news in just a few minutes. Thanks for watching, and uh, don't go anywhere. We'll be back. Young Turks. It's very rare in this day and age to find something new on TV. We found television fans get secret on public access. A show 33. He's just an actor. A nice job. He had an idea. A talk show. He rates women. Hi, we're the Young Turks. I'm your host, Jake Uger. I'm in New York right now in uh, Rebel Headquarters, East Coast, Dylan Radigan's office at MSNBC. Um, and uh, well, this is one of our final shows on Sirius and XM. Oh, so sad. It actually is. I, I feel like, you know, I'm a nostalgic guy to begin with. I feel incredibly nostalgic about this. Uh, we will be talking about uh, the different great moments in Young Turks slash Sirius XM history uh, throughout the week. Friday will be our final broadcast. Uh, I'll be doing the show today, obviously. Uh, tomorrow, Ben will be doing the show. And then uh, on Friday for the final show, Ben and I will be together again. And we have a fun, special, surprise guest for you guys. Oh, I said it. There it is. Fun, special, surprise guest. Okay, so don't miss that show. And... Um, all right, you know what? I'll give you one of the uh, fun, magical moments from our times in Sirius. Uh, the 99-hour filibuster. You guys remember when we did that? When uh, Samuel Alito was up for uh, the Supreme Court and the Democrats refused to filibuster him, even though they had said that they were going to keep their powder dry until they got someone like Sam Alito. And then they still said they weren't going to do it. And we, I, like, I was so mad over it, I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, we did a 99-hour filibuster on air, and uh, and a, a large, large chunk of that was on Sirius. They carried it live for a long period of time. And, you know, looking back at that uh, show that we did, and by the way, I did, you can't do 99 hours straight. You had to get a couple hours of sleep here and there, right? So I did 78 out of the 99 hours, but every, but as a show, we did the whole 99 hours. You know, uh, looking back on it, some of the people who filled in for us and who stepped up to bat, we just started it, right, without consulting anyone. And then other progressives called us and said, can we help out? You want to get a couple of uh, hours of break, and I'll do the show for you. And guys who did that were Tom Hartman, okay, um, 
Jane Hampshire of FireDogLake.com. That was the first time I'd ever heard of Jane Hampshire. Okay, and she had come on the show. I think John Amato from Crooks and Liars, uh, Brad Friedman from Brad Blog. I bel- I think Peter was it Peter B. Collins did a did a stretch on there. I forget if Mike Malloy did or not, but it was it was kind of magical. I, I mean, that was a long time ago. Now that was what five years ago, I think four or five years ago. So that was one of the great moments that we had on Series Six. So, oh my God, I'm getting Gary on. No, but seriously, I'm a nostalgic guy, and it's ironic because we're I'm doing the show across the street from Series here, but we can't do the video setup over there, so we had to do it over here. But, anyways, so don't miss Friday, full of nostalgia. And all right, let's do the news of today. Okay. Well, what do we have in the news today? Oh <laughs> uh, well. Full of, uh, uh, you know, look, you know what, I'm going to say full of disasters, but to be fair, yesterday there was a little bit of hope. And over the last couple of days, I've been giving some of the Tea Party guys and the Republicans credit uh, for sticking to what their real principles, and, and those are good principles, on earmarks, for example, right? And on possibly cutting defense. And, you know, I, I forget, but there was another senator that came out today. Oh, it was Coburn. Uh, Coburn came out and said, no, 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 we, we should, you know, we should really start talking about cutting defense. So they seem to be getting pretty serious about it. I mean, every time I see those stories, I think kudos to them. That's fantastic. Um, now, having said that, time for, unfortunately, the two usual uh, topics. One is Republican treachery, and two is Democratic and Obama White House weakness. So let's start with the treachery first. We actually brought this to you on the Young Turks almost before any other media outlet was doing it. Obviously, I read about it uh, in, in a newspaper, but uh, not a lot of people, TV, radio, etc., were doing it. Anyway, it's a START treaty. Uh, the Republicans, uh, led by John Kyle, basically said, no, we're not going to give you the START treaty. Now, the START treaty uh, reduces our uh, stockpile of nuclear weapons, uh, but it's a treaty with the Russians, and that means they also reduce their stockpile. Uh, plus, on top of that, uh, we get to verify their, that they're reducing it, and we get to check in on their nuclear program. It is enormously important for national security. Look, one of the things that uh, it, we should be most concerned about is whether terrorists get their hands on nukes. There's no more serious national security issue. It is, in my opinion, the national security issue. And what would help is if we were able to keep an eye on the Russian stockpile. And because the Republicans are going to block this, we won't be able to. Now, we, I, you know, we did this on the MSNBC show. That's on at 3 o'clock Eastern every day. You can check that out uh, through November. And we had Josh Trevino, who's a guy I like, who's a conservative, but I, I think he's an honest guy, etc. And we were debating whether the Republicans had any valid uh, reason to block this treaty. And you know me. If they come up with a good point, I, I'm... Hey, I am the most open-minded man in America. But seriously, I would very much consider it. There are no good points on this. He's talking about, oh, well, now, you know, we need to be able to do missile defense tests. We do plenty of that, and and the treaty would still allow for plenty of that. That ain't the problem. Look, you know, I've talked about this before. Of course, the main thing is they just want to block Obama, right? And they want to say, ha ha, you didn't get your foreign policy victory, and we don't give a damn what happens about national security, because we're Republicans, and all we care about is politics. And there's no way I'm backing away from that. That is 99.8% of the explanation. The only other 0.2% of the explanation that's possible is that they actually want to build more nukes, because the Republican Party gets financed by the defense contractors that build nukes. Okay? So they still can make a lot of money. So... But there is no part of this uh, treaty where you could make a legitimate argument saying that it's not a good treaty. No way, no how. To give you a sense of it, the Republicans that are out of office, like every former Republican Secretary of State, is saying, uh, for the love of God, pass the treaty. Okay, uh, Richard Lugar, who's the one guy in foreign policy that I've always thought was good on the Republican side. I've been saying that for eight years now, to some people's annoyance. And he's coming out and saying, "Oh, come on, this is re- we got to pass the treaty. This is crazy." But the Republicans don't give a damn. 
Hey, look, you know, I guess people think this is like, like wow. Like if I say it on TV, and which I did today, they're like, whoa, wow, oh, how can you say, whoa, 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 whoa. I, no, 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 they're politicians. Look, Democrats do this too in other contexts. But in this case, the Republicans, you think they care about the policy? Come on, please don't tell me you're that naive. You think they care about, oh, no, there's a national security issue. We better make sure we got the loose nukes under control. No, all they care about is the politics and the campaign contributions. They're not honest actors. Stop treating the politicians with all this reverence. They should have no reverence. They certainly don't deserve it. And what the Republicans did today, it's, it's loathsome, loathsome. You know, there's one other thing, by the way. There's another angle to this. Can they really stop the START treaty altogether? I don't think so, right? I think in the long run, they're going to give in anyway, right? But it's not that they're going to give in. Now, right now, they only have 41 senators. They're going to get six more senators after the next year. And they're delaying the vote, right? So they're saying we're going to have it the year after. Now, if they do that, then they're going to come to Obama. And you, see, because you need two-thirds to ratify the treaty. He can't do it with just the Democratic senators. It's even more of a higher standard than a filibuster, right? So then Obama's going to need, I think, 14 Republicans to vote with him next year. So then John Kyle and others are going to come by and go, all right, we'll vote for the START Treaty if you give us what we want. And then they're going to ask for a king's ransom. Again, would you ask for a king's ransom if you, know, you cared about national security? No, but if you wanted to hold national security hostage... So you can get your goodies, well, then I would make you a politician. And that apparently is almost the entire Republican Party. Dick Luger is a definite exception, senator from Indiana in this case. Now, there is some good news here. President Obama, the White House right now signaling, we're going to hold the vote anyway, okay? Which I think would be great. Now, let's see if they follow through on that. But basically, they're going to put the Republicans on the spot and say, Really? Okay, we're going to call your bluff. Go ahead and vote against the START Treaty. And then we'll take it to the American people. Now, look, I'm doing this based on experience. My guess is that even if the Democrats did that, that they wouldn't have good follow-through. Like, if you do that, and I love it, I, and I hope they do do it, you have to follow through and then beat them up in the press and be like, oh, the Republicans who don't care about national security, the Republicans who are endangering our security, the Republicans that have are allowing loose nukes on the thing. Now, do you think Obama's got the guts and the and the ability to do that? I hope so. And it's a good sign that he's saying that they're gonna hold a vote. I would be surprised. But Mr. President, let's go up and at him. This is this is how politics works. If they're going to screw you on this for political reasons, you better fight back. You're, you're on excellent policy ground here, and I'm sure a great majority of Americans would agree with the president on this issue. Well, if you don't take it to them on this, well, you ain't ever going to take it to them. So let's see what happens over the next couple of days and see if the president does fight back. At least since they said they would, there's some hope they will. All right. Now, I guess that's partly the good from the White House on that. There's, of course, bad news as well. So now, and it's not on this issue, it's a different issue. Many issues. Okay. Uh, the guy who's replacing Larry Summers, it looks like the, the candidate they're going to go with is Roger Alt. He was in Clinton's uh, economic team. Uh, he works on Wall Street now. He's written an editorial before saying that Clinton has to improve his relations with the business community, which he is a part of. Uh, and he says, no, 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 don't worry, business community. Uh, President Obama has been fantastic to you. Which, you know, if he's talking about Wall Street, I don't really disagree with. Uh, and he says, uh, but you know what? He does have to improve, and he needs to give us more goodies. That's the guy that's going to come replace Larry Summers. <laughs> Roger Altman, completely within the corporatist wing of the Democratic Party, and so those of you who had hoped that once we got the incredibly conservative Larry Summers out of the most important economic position outside of the Treasury Secretary out of the White House, well, <laughs> your hope of replacing him with a progressive, gone, obliterated, off into the air. Of course, he's going to go with someone who's even more corporatist, more pro-big business, 
more pro Wall Street. It's <laughs> these are the days you lose hope, man. And, and look, they they blame us for saying it. You can shoot the messenger all you like, but the message is still the same. I didn't pick Roger Altman. You picked Roger Altman. Now, the, all the reports, and Bloomberg is reporting this, all the reports could be wrong, and Obama could come in and say, no, I'm going with Robert Reich or uh, Joseph Stiglitz. <laughs> if I was you, I wouldn't hold your breath. Okay. Now he's going to go with Altman, and Altman is going to suggest that, uh, and by the way, I already know one of his suggestions. It's in the, in the public. He has said, we should immediately lower the corporate tax rate. Barack Obama. Change you can believe in? He's Ron Burgundy? <laughs> Disaster. Young Turks.